Mm. You shouldn't be able to hear me. It says so here. <laughs> Let's go. Anyway, try. Okay. Well, if you can hear me, then yell. Shall we try this one? Yes, yes. Stand up. Para se apertir el clip. No? Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to talk, to talk here. So this is going to be an overview of work done in recent years in collaboration with a number of people. The earliest part of this work was, sorry, how do I put it? So the, can you hear me now? Okay. <coughs> so the, the earliest part of this work was in collaboration with Rob Myers, and then there's also going to be mention of work with uh, Harvey Vial, with Henrietta Elvan, with my student Paul Figueras. And I'm also going to discuss a work done uh, more recently, and which is, should be, be appearing soon, with uh, Truth Harmack, Nils Roberts, uh, Vasilis Niarcos, and my student uh, Maria Jose Rodriguez as well. So what is what we're trying to do? <coughs> well, we want to find all the stationary solutions of the instance equations, and this talk I'm going to restrict myself to just the vacuum case, with some specified uh, boundary conditions. And again, in this talk, I'm just going to talk about uh, asymptotically flat boundary conditions. And we want these solutions to have uh, event horizons and the solutions to have no naked singularities. So <coughs> the solutions should be regular on and outside the event horizons. Now, <coughs> when we have found the solutions, we want to plot a phase diagram, and I will show you a number of them so you see what I mean by this. And with this phase diagram, one can do several things, and there are several interesting questions that one may want to answer, like what are the solutions that uh, have the maximum total horizon area? <coughs> That is the maximum uh, total entropy. Now, there's another issue that I'm not going to discuss today, and that's the classical stability of these solutions. This is an important but very difficult problem, and uh, I'll just mention a few things uh, today, but this is not going to be the focus of uh, my talk. Now, what's the story then in four dimensions? Well, this is well known from early times. <coughs> You know that in four dimensions, in vacuum uh, and with asymptotically flat boundary conditions, the only, the only solution that uh, exists is the curved black hole. There's a uniqueness theorem that tells you that if you specify the mass and the angular momentum of the black hole, then it can only be this solution, the curve one. Now, if we plot, <coughs> well, in general relativity, classical general relativity, we can always fix a scale arbitrarily, and in this talk, I'll always fix the scale by fixing the mass to be equal to one. So if we fix the mass to 1, then we have another control parameter, which is the angular momentum, and then what I do is plot the area, the horizon area, as a function of the angular momentum. Now, if I start here with the Schwarzschild solution, then as I increase it, as I increase the angular momentum, then the uh, horizon area decreases until we reach a point where we find a solution, which is extremal. Beyond this solution, there's no uh, regular black hole. But this solution, this solution is perfectly fine. It has a regular horizon with finite horizon area. Now, this is the whole story in four dimensions. There's no possibility, for example, of having a uh, multi curve solution, a multi black hole solution, just because uh, if you try to have two uh, curved black holes, then their attraction is too strong and they cannot be kept stationary without uh, naked singularities. Now, <coughs> what do we have in more than four dimensions? Well, Myers and Perry, over 20 years ago, they found the generalizations of the curve solution in D dimensions. All the solutions, they have a topology, which uh, the topology of a sphere. 
And in principle, it's possible to have rotation, several independent uh, rotation planes. But in this talk, I'm going to restrict myself to the possibility of a rotation in just one plane. Now, in five dimensions, these mass per black holes <coughs> with a single spin, they, well, they begin to, be, uh, to behave a little bit like the curve solution. So as you increase, uh, as you increase the angular momentum, the, the area decreases. But there's a difference with the four dimensional case in that the extremal limit now is singular. It has zero area. Right? So this is one difference that we find when we go to higher dimensions. But when we go to six or more dimensions, the differences are more <coughs> striking. In fact, what we find is that the area, again, begins to decrease as we increase the spin. And then it continues decreasing mo <coughs> monotonously, but it never reaches zero. We can have black holes with arbitrarily large spin for a given uh, total mass. Right? As one does this, in this regime, the black holes become more and more pancaked along the plane of rotation, but still they have a regular uh, horizon with finite area. Question? Yes? Uh, in principle, in, uh, in five dimensions, you can have two independent rotation planes. So I'm just considering uh, that the solutions that spin in one of the planes. The spin in the other plane is set to zero. Uh, yeah, it's, well, I mean, you, the self-dual and the anti-self-dual, it's saying the self-dual. <coughs> is this all there is in five dimensions? No. We know that uh, from at least uh, six years ago that there's more than just the mass per black hole in five dimensions because uh, uh, six years ago, Harvey Real and I found some exact explicit solutions of five-dimensional vacuum gravity where the solutions describe black holes in the shape of a ring with a horizon topology S1 cross S2. This come in two varieties. Uh, sorry. This come in two varieties. One of them is what we call the thin black ring. The other one is the fat black ring, for obvious reasons. So this is the mass per black hole. And then at this point, at some value of the angular momentum, this, uh, new, these two branches of solutions appear. This one extends all the way to infinite uh, spin and becomes thinner and thinner as you increase the spin. But this other one uh, has an upper bound on the angular momentum. It's always below this curve. And then it goes to the same singular solution as the mass spectral hole went to uh, in, this, in this limit. Now, these solutions, they provide you with uh, an explicit example that uh, in higher dimensions, other topologies than the sphere are possible. But perhaps more striking is the fact that they provide you also with a counterexample to uniqueness. Uniqueness, black hole uniqueness, is not, does not hold in five dimensions because in this range of parameters you see that if you fix the mass, which we're always doing, and then if you fix the angular momentum, then in this range you have three solutions with the same mass and with the same angular momentum. So this is just a, an explicit counterexample that black hole uniqueness does not admit any simple generalization to uh, at least five dimensions. Now, is this all there is in five dimensions? No, because in five dimensions, as I'm going to show you now, it's also, also possible to have multi-black hole solutions which are stationary and which are regular. And in fact, well, the simplest one is what we call a black Saturn. And the way that this appears is that you start from a black ring, it's rotating, and now you put just a black hole at the center. You have to spin up the black ring a little faster in order to counterbalance the extra gravitational attraction, but it's possible to do this. <coughs> the angular moment, the rotating black hole can be uh, at the center, can be rotating in the same, same sense as the black ring, or it can be counter-rotating. And uh, explicit solutions for these uh, configurations are possible. It's possible to find them fully explicitly. <coughs> this was done in work by Henrietta Elman and Paul Figueras. And there are several, I mean, their paper, they studied this uh, composition in detail. But one of the things that, uh, uh, one of the properties that these solutions are very easily seen to, to process is that they exhibit a double continuous non-uniqueness. I mean, previously we had a discrete non-uniqueness. Here we can have, uh, we can fix the total mass and angular momentum, and we still have two continuous parameters that we can vary while keeping this, uh, these two other fixed. So this is, again, more of uh, an example of a uh, lack of uniqueness. This double continuous non-uniqueness, nevertheless, it can be completely removed if we demand that the solutions are in thermal equilibrium, which means, uh, in thermodynamical equilibrium, this means that the temperature of the black hole and the black ring have to be equal, and also the angular velocities, they have to be equal. These two conditions completely remove this uh, 
the generality of uh, black saturns that uh, I described earlier. And then with these conditions, the phases that we have are <coughs> like this. So this is the mass per black hole, as we've seen before. This curve over here is the curve of uh, black rings, and below this is the curve corresponding to uh, these uh, black saturns. Now, <coughs> is this all there is? Well, in this case, maybe yes, we still don't know, but uh, we're, I think we're approaching a complete classification of five dimensional black holes. There was the a theorem restricting the topology, proved, uh, proven uh, recently by Galloway and Shen, which says that uh, the only two topologies are these ones that uh, we've already found. There's also a rigidity theorem. In four dimensions, the rigidity, rigidity theorem tells you that if you have a stationary black hole with one time like filling vector, then there must be also an axial filling vector. Now, in four dimensions, this is very restrictive, but in, in five dimensions, it's much less restrictive because, as we said, we can have a second axis of symmetry. And in principle, the theorem that uh, Holland and collaborators uh, proved doesn't uh, imply that the stationary implies uh, two axial U1s. It's not clear whether this uh, can be strengthened, strengthened or not, but uh, if it were necessary to have two axial uh, killing symmetries, besides the stationary one, then in this case, the system is completely integra integrable, basically because you can integrate out these three directions and then find a two-dimensional sigma, sigma model. And in this case, well, this uh, complete integrability also allows one to find, uh, to construct uh, solutions, the, the solution generating techniques, and perhaps we may have already found all the um, black hole solutions in this, in this theory, essentially all, up to multi multi black hole solutions with arbitrary large numbers of uh, black holes. So maybe the, all there is as the mass per black hole, the black rings, and these uh, multi black holes. It's also possible <coughs> to, to construct uh, black rings with two spins, even if I'm not uh, talking about this. So maybe we have all the solutions. There are a few things that uh, we have to check yet, but perhaps we, we have already the complete catalog of five dimensional black holes in, in vacuum gravity. Now, <coughs> there are some corners to be swept, as I said, but then we want to move on to six or more dimensions. And in this case, well, the subject that just uh, explodes in, in our hands. Why should we expect D larger uh, or equal than six to be different? Well, there are several reasons. One of them is that, uh, I mean, besides the fact that we get more degrees of freedom for the graviton, right? So besides this, you can see that the balance of forces between uh, centrifugal repulsion and gravitational attraction changes qualitatively as we go to six or more dimensions. So the gravitational attraction goes like this, so it falls off in a dimension-dependent way, but the rotational, the gravitational, the centrifugal repulsion is confined to a plane, to the plane of rotation, so this doesn't depend on number of dimensions, and then you can see that four is different from five, five is different from six, and then from six on we have a something that looks qualitatively similar. And in fact, this is what's behind this uh, possibility of having arbitrary large angular momentum for a given mass. Another reason that uh, six dimensions uh, or more is uh, different is that in six or more dimensions we can have black p brains with p larger than two. So in five dimensions we have the black strings and then we could take a black string and then form it into uh, a ring and then we have the black rings. Now, <coughs> we try to do the same thing for, uh, say, a membrane with a horizon which is R2 cross S2, then we might try to form this into the shape of a torus, two sphere, or perhaps some higher dimensional or some higher genus uh, surface. We don't know yet which of these possibilities are actually realized, but there's clearly more room, and the more dimensions we have, there's even more room for new, new possibilities. So, can we go then find all these uh, new solutions? Well, we can try, but then it turns out that if you try to apply the techniques that were successful in four and five dimensions, then you find that uh, well, these are uh, dead ends, mostly. The known explicit construction, construction techniques uh, just uh, don't, don't apply. Uh, as you go to higher dimensions, of course, the classification of topologies is uh, less and less uh, well understood. So, it really looks like uh, we have to try new ideas and uh, what I'm going to describe here is how we're trying to use methods which are less rigorous, more qualitative, inspired by physics, which allow us to get a hold on uh, the phase diagram and possible uh, black hole solutions. And this may also be useful if uh, we convince the numerical people to try to attack this problem. Well, we can tell them, well, look here, because we expect here to find a new branch of black holes. 
So, uh, among these uh, qualitative methods, uh, I'm going to describe a couple of them. Uh, one of them is uh, related to the possibility of having what we call lumpy black holes in six or more dimensions. This was uh, uh, proposed and suggested by Rob Myers and myself in a paper six years ago. So, as I said, in six or more dimensions, we can have this ultra spinning regime where the black hole pancakes along the plane of rotation. In fact, there's a well defined limit where the black hole becomes a black membrane, a black two brain. Now, black two brains of infinite extent, you know that they have a Gregory Laplace instability, and at the onset of the Gregory Laplace instability, you have a zero mode which gives rise to a new branch of solutions that Toby Weisman, Steve Gabser, and uh, other people have studied. So, just like black membranes give you uh, lumpy black holes in homogeneous uh, black, black membranes, then in this case we conjecture that there should be an axially symmetric zero mode from which, uh, at the onset of the instability, there should be an axially symmetric zero mode, and from this you can deform, you, you should be able to deform the horizon into something that looks like, it's not a peanut, it's uh, something that's rotating, it's kind of a black hole with a dimple, a dimple sat at the center. Now, <coughs> as you increase further the angular momentum, then as said, the second uh, harmonic of the gorilla plum uh, instability should appear, and then this is going to give a uh, black hole with a dimple, a circular uh, dimple. And then as you increase further the angular momentum, the conjecture is that there are more axially symmetric dimples and black holes like this. Now, this was uh, proposed, uh, as I said, several years ago. It turns out that very recently, not these solutions, but the duals, the plasma, plasma balls have been constructed by Lahiri and Minwala. So they found uh, in the, doing the analysis of the, in the hydrodynamic limit of the CFT that they, they found the solutions that should correspond to precisely this, uh, this kind of black holes. So they really seem to be there. Now, this is one of the things that we found, uh, say, using qualitative uh, methods. Now, another thing that we may try to see is whether we can find uh, thin black rings in more in six uh, or more dimensions. The heuristic construction of a black ring is to start from a black string and then form it into a circle. In any dimension larger than uh, five or larger than, than, than five, we can have uh, black strings and then in principle it looks like it should be possible to have this as well. And in this sense, the thin black ring should be something like a circular boosted black string. Now the question is whether you can, in every dimension, whether you can balance, whether you can always choose the angular momentum so that you find a stationary solution. This is a question that in fact for thin black rings can be analyzed just using linear gravity. And the reason is that when you have a thin black ring, then the balance of forces is just between the tension of the black ring and the centrifugal repulsion, because these things are confined to a plane. The gravitational self-attraction dies away faster and faster with the number of dimensions, so this is a subdominant effect. And then the idea is, well, can we construct at least approximate thin ring solutions? Well, we think we can, well, in fact we have, using the method of uh, much asymptotic uh, expansions, which was uh, used in a related context by Truls Harmark and Dan Gorgonos and Barak Kohl. So the idea here is to start, since we want to describe a thin black ring, we start where the limit, where in the limit where the uh, ring is very thin, so we construct a linearized solution around flat space, a linearized solution of gravity. Instead of the black ring, we put, we put an equivalent delta source, which gives a field that large in sense, which is equivalent to the expected field of a black ring. So this is a solution where if R zero is the size of the of these spheres over here, then this is a limit where this is very small. This is our linear expansion parameter. Next, we go to the other to the, to the opposite end where we have a black string and then we want to see whether we can curve it so that it has some large curvature, curvature radius. So this is a limit where we're expanding in powers of 1 over r where r is the radius of the black ring. So we're curving this, we're considering linear perturbations around the black string and this, well the problem of uh, perturbations for the black string, this is going to be, uh, give us a homogeneous equation so we need boundary conditions to fix the integration constants. So in order to find the bound these boundary conditions to, find the, to fix this, these constants, what we do is we match these two solutions in the regime where both are valid, which is this regime of uh, radii. Right? Now, what one finds in this case is that if, uh, if one computes one over r corrections to the black string, then these are singular unless the pressure along the ring vanishes. Now, this is important because this allows us to determine what's the radius of equilibrium 
for a configuration for the black ring with a given spin and given mass. So if we fix the mass and we give it a spin, we don't expect black rings to exist for all values of the radii, only for some values where the thing is uh, in equilibrium. This, in fact, it's uh, basically the same condition as uh, requiring uh, conservation of the stress in the tensor. Now, if we have this condition, then this means that, well, we can compute the area for this object. In principle, the area would be a function of the mass, the spin and the radius, but this condition allows us to eliminate R in favor of uh, M and J, and this is the kind of uh, information that we need in order to plot the phase diagram. So if we have, if we take this, the result of these calculations, and then we put it in the five, uh, in the six uh, dimensional phase diagram, again we're fixing the mass, this is the curve for the Myers per black holes, now if we put what we got from the linearized analysis of the equilibrium of the uh, thin black ring, we find a curve like this, and what we see is that black rings dominate the entropy at large uh, spin. Now, it's also possible to put in uh, these uh, black atoms, and then we get still higher entropy than the black, uh, black hole, but lower than the black ring. Now, <coughs> can we do any, any better? I mean, we have the form of these curves. So, can we extend these curves to the rest of the uh, phase diagram? Well, we can. I mean, in principle, one would need to solve here, gravity in a regime where we're far from uh, linear and linear approximation. This is the deep nonlinear regime. But we're going to use, use uh, information from other corners in order to make a plausible conjecture for how the uh, phase diagram is filled. And in order to do this, what we do is we take, again, this analogy, this, uh, uh, this analogy between the black membranes and the ultraspinning black holes. So this is something that, uh, well, there's a well-defined limit where this thing becomes like this. And also, well, in this analogy, the black ring is similar to a, a localized uh, black string, in a sense, in this, in this context. Now, <coughs> for uh, the black membrane, we also know of the existence of these, uh, these other phases, so it's then natural to conjecture the existence of these other uh, counterparts. Also, what's important is that we know what the phase diagram is for these objects, something like this, we plot S, the entropy, as a function of L, where L is this size, which is comparable to the spin. We have this phase over here and this phase over here for both cases. So we have here this, uh, the analog of the black membrane is the Myers per black hole. Here it's the analog of the localized uh, object. And then we just have to stick in these two other phases in this phase diagram. And then what we get is this conjecture for this, uh, the, how to complete this phase diagram. So you see that uh, we expect to have these lumpy black holes <coughs> uh, branching from this uh, some point over here, and then at some point they pinch off. The point where they pinch off it's not clear, and then they join to the branch of uh, black rings. In principle, we can also expect to find copies of this with more uh, pinches. So this would be a black Saturn, and well, uh, in principle, there should be are repetitions of this at higher and higher spins. So this is telling us that we expect an infinite sequence of black holes with uh, multiple lumps and also with uh, multiple rings and multiple satons. This is the study I have to say in dimensions. Uh, there's some funny dimension uh, de dependence of the Gregor Lapin stability uh, that was found by Sorkin. At uh, dimension 13, uh, the phase diagram changes. It's not really well known how, how it goes, but a reasonable conjecture is that it does something like this. So instead of going backwards, here we, we increase the entropy as we go into the branch of lumpy solutions. So this is the conjecture for D around 13 or more. We don't really know when the things are rotating, whether the critical dimension will be the same, but there's going to be some uh, dependence on some change at some dimensions. And again, there should be some infinite sequence of multi lumps and multi black rings. So, come to my conclusions. I don't know how I'm doing with time. Uh, okay, so again, I mean, you will have plenty of time to, uh, for questions and for going to the bus. So, well, my conclusion here, I hope that I have convinced you that uh, when it comes to black holes, more is different in, different in the sense that uh, the higher, the more dimensions that you have, the richer behavior that, uh, that you get. If... Uh, Anyone ever thought that uh, black holes in higher dimensions should be just uh, like uh, black holes in four dimensions, then they couldn't be more wrong. So we've seen, well, first of all, I'm going to go up in, uh, going up in the number of dimensions. Back in gravity, in, say, in three dimensions, it has no black holes. 
in the synthetic, in the synthetic flat case. And one reason for this is that uh, G times M is dimensionless. Besides the theory and the, the fact that the theory is topological, there, is, there are no propagating degrees of freedom. You can see more simply that since GM is dimensionless, there's no length scale to tell you where to put the, the horizon. You have to provide some length scale in order to find a, a black hole horizon. Now, in four dimensions, we've seen that there's one black hole, the curved black hole. But again, since there are no three-dimensional black holes, we cannot, fly, uh, we cannot form uh, four-dimensional black strings and then we cannot form uh, black rings. This is one uh, simple way, if not a very rigorous way, of seeing why black rings are, aren't expected here. In five dimensions, we have three black holes. So that's the Myers-Perry black hole and two varieties of uh, black rings. There are two different topologies. We saw that there are black strings, and the black strings give rise to black rings and then to this uh, black Saturn, so an infinitely many uh, multi black holes, stationary multi black holes. And six or more dimensions, we still don't know the full answer, but there seem to be infinitely many black holes. There are many possible topologies, and we don't really know yet uh, which ones are possible and which ones aren't. There are lumpy horizons, so it, horizons can be, even if the topology is spherical, the, there are va different varieties of black holes. We saw that the, well, the possibility of having black brains gives you all these uh, other possible black holes and an infinite uh, class of uh, multi-black hole solutions. And uh, I think that this is uh, just, uh, we're beginning to see the tip of the iceberg. So in a sense, uh, we've just begun. And then, well, with this, I'll stop here and thank you. So, do we have any, any questions? Yes, Gary. So, in connection with your dimpled black holes, you mentioned this recent work by Minwala and, and Lahiri, I guess, in terms of plasma balls. But I, under, I thought that was a, for, for four-dimensional gauge theories and was relevant for sort of dual ADS asymptotically ADS black holes. So what connection does it have with six-dimensional asymptotically flat black holes? Now, the pinch uh, black holes, they appear when you consider a five-dimensional gauge theory. I mean, they found, in, with the four-dimensional gauge theory, they found the uh, black rings and the uh, uh, smooth uh, black holes, but then going, they, they also conjecture what the media conjecture on what you get when you go to one more dimension. So they solved the, the equation for the five-dimensional gauge theory. And then they found these uh, pinch uh, black holes. Now, of course, there's a condition. The, 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 this uh, constant that they have, uh, they need to have some cosmological constant. So this is going to restrict uh, the range of angular momentum. So when, roughly, when the uh, black hole gets uh, of, uh, size larger than the cosmological constant, then things are going to change. But uh, this part of the phase diagram, which corresponds to smaller black holes, that's going to be similar to this. Any other? I see this uh, question over there. Oh, yeah, Ed. Well, perhaps you've said so already, but are the five dimensional black holes stable with black patterns? Uh, well, stability, <coughs> well, I didn't say it already. Yeah, in fact, I said that I wouldn't uh, comment on this. But I can say a few things. Well, stability in five dimensions is a very difficult problem. In four dimensions, uh, doing the uh, analysis of uh, linearized uh, perturbations is something that uh, worked out just by miracle. It's uh, one of these uh, miracles that happens in four dimensions that the Tukolsky equations could be found, uh, I mean, that one could decouple equations and then separate variables. Now, in five dimensions, you have more degrees of freedom. The problem becomes much more complicated. It's not solved. In some cases, well, the stability of the static solution has been proven, but we don't know anything or almost anything about the solutions uh, with finite angular momentum. Black rings, they have been argued to be unstable in several regimes. For example, the fat black rings, we think that they are radially unstable, that if you perturb them radially a little bit, they will, say, collapse into a mass per black hole. Thin black rings are expected to suffer from the gregor laflamme instability because they are just like black strings. But we don't really know whether there's a window of uh, stability for the neutral solutions. When they have charges, things change. So we don't really know much about the stability. This is something that's been explored uh, only with uh, semi-qualitative methods, mostly. Which one has the largest energy? Uh, well, I can show you. Uh, how does this? Can I go faster somehow? Uh, 
Well, in this case, the one with the largest entropy is this one, in this regime of uh, spins. In this regime of, sp of spins, it's the myers pell black hole. In all regimes, the phase with the largest entropy is a black saturn, but black saturns, most of them are probably classically unstable, because the black ring is going to be classically unstable as well. We don't really know which ones are stable or which ones are not. So it's quite likely that the, that the phases with the highest area are uh, classically unstable. Uh, well, entropy, if you want to really do thermodynamics, then you have to take into account the uh, Hawking radiation, which I haven't included here. For example, this uh, black, Saturn, uh, black Saturns over here, you can have them, I mean, they can be perfectly uh, valid stationary solutions, even if they have the central object has different temperature than the uh, black ring. For example, in this, in this case, you expect that this object, which is larger, the size is characteristically larger, it has a this should have a smaller temperature than this one because the temperature of the black ring is controlled basically by the size of this uh, circle. So in this case, uh, the two objects act, uh, I mean, if you don't include the Hawking radiation, these two objects act like separate thermodynamical objects in a sense. It's Hawking radiation that, that connects one to the other. And then Hawking radiation, in order, if you want to, say, put this in a box and then have the object in thermodynamical equilibrium, then Hawking radiation is going to equilibrate first the temperatures of the two objects and also the rotation uh, velocities. Now, the object may be uh, still unstable, but then what's going to happen probably is that the, well, black holes can evaporate into Hawking radiation and then the entropy increases. Yes. Uh, well, we know very little about uh, black rings and all these phases in uh, ADS. We're trying to learn a little, but uh, it's still all very preliminary. Yeah, putting things in a box should give us uh, more control over uh, thermodynamics. Right, but we don't know yet. Come here. Are there black uh, Saturn solutions or the spinning? Can you have with opposite? Uh, so, uh, spinning in different ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You can. Okay. <coughs> so, yes, yes. So, my question is if you can make them spin zero, yes. how does it compare with yes. the cycle without? I mean, you, 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 in fact, with black Saturns, you can cover uh, this uh, a whole strip in extending to infinity, covering all this, uh, all this region. With, uh, by tuning the parameters of the two objects, you can have uh, black Saturns with a total zero uh, spin. You can even uh, have uh, the central black hole uh, static. Uh, so you, yeah, you have so to. So the question which one has higher entropy, the spin less spherical symmetric or this one? Well, as I said, you, you can, with black Saturns, you can cover all. Of, so you can have uh, black Saturns with uh, zero spin covering all the way from here up to here. Not more than the spherical Not more than that. Uh -huh. The maximum value of the, of the entropy, of the total area, is given by the area of the static uh, solution. Any further questions? I have one in that case, okay. uh, Roberto. Uh, can one prove an analog of Hawking's theorem about the area always increasing if you have a collision between... Uh, yeah, well, the loss of uh, black hole thermodynamics just go through because they don't depend on... Uh, but that's purely, that's purely a classical statement. Yes. doesn't really, not really yes. about thermodynamics, but... Uh, I mean, the this, yeah, in, in classical, yeah, in the classical yeah. Yeah, all the theorems of classical black hole mechanics mm -hmm. just go through. Okay. Let's, uh, let's thank Roberto again for that beautiful talk. And, uh, well, I think we have half an hour before the...